This is Thursday, March 21st, 2013. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today David Hawley. Welcome, David. Thank you very much. May I ask when you were born? I was born on 12-8-1949. And where were you born? I was born in Lake Forest, Illinois. And where is Lake Forest? Lake Forest is actually uh, located next to Lake Michigan in Illinois. It's, it's approximately, it's north of Chicago, mm -hmm. and it's probably about 11 miles uh, next to Great Lakes, which is a big naval training center. Mm -hmm. And you'll get to know all about that a little <laughs> later on in life. <laughs> right. And how long did you live in Lake Forest? Actually, I lived in Lake Forest uh, until I was ready to go to high school. And then my parents, who are from New England area, from uh, Maynard and Acton, mm -hmm. uh, they wanted to come back here, so they moved back here. So. And where did you go to high school? I went to Marion High School, a proprial school. Mm -hmm. um, it was a college uh, kind of type program school. I was preparing to go to college at that mm -hmm. point. Where did you live when you were attending Marion? Um, I, was, I lived in Kachichuit, uh, which was kind of a part of Wayland. It mm -hmm. was a small town, had a few stores, car places, and that. It was uh, relatively quiet. Mm -hmm. And what did your parents do for a living? My father actually uh, was an estate gardener when he, f uh, when we moved out, when he moved out to Lake Forest. He worked on estates of, for armor and meat, for uh, Gillette blades, mm -hmm. um, um, you know, opulent money, uh, these places, swimming pools with koi fish. Instead of <laughs> swimming in them, they had koi fish in them. Mm -hmm. um, my mother worked in civil service, and there was actually a Ford out there, Ford Sheridan, she worked there. Mm -hmm. And what town do you currently live in? I live in the town of Hopkinton. Your marital status? Divorced. And do you have children? Yes, I kind of started on the back end. I now have a seven-year-old boy. Mm -hmm. And I understand you also have a brother. Yes, I do. I have a brother that's considered an Irish twin. He was born, uh, we're, there's 10 months difference between mm -hmm. us. And did he join the military? Uh, he tried to join the military. Uh, he was unable to get in because he had a medical uh, right. problem. Where and when did you enter the military? Well, um, I entered the military in Boston, mm -hmm. um, uh, I was one of those lucky people, I can't win the lottery for money or anything, but I can win the lottery for, at that point in time, it, it was, they did have a lottery, mm -hmm. and my number was 37. Uh, so I uh, had to go take a physical in Boston, and then I, uh, that's actually where, um, at that point, after I took the physical, um, what happened was that I got my little package in the mail, and it was Army was on the package, mm -hmm. and someone told me if if I, uh, you know, wanted to really have a choice in what I was doing, that I should join the Navy. Mm -hmm. So I ended up uh, enlisting into the Navy, and I never opened my package. <laughs> Any idea what happened to the package? Uh, I, I have no idea where it is. It's, <laughs> it's probably with all my other papers. Okay. You know. And uh, could you tell me exactly when you joined or enlisted in the Navy? What year? Yes, it was uh, January 21st, mm -hmm. 1970. A day I will always <laughs> remember. <laughs> remember. <laughs> okay. Were you just getting out of high school or in college? No, actually, I, I was out of high school, mm -hmm. and I had applied to colleges, and mm -hmm. um, the one thing about the school I had gone to, they really had no art program. I, I was into a lot of art. I applied mm -hmm. to mass art, but my portfolio wasn't big enough, so I ended up uh, going to the what they call ITT right now, and it used mm -hmm. to be the mass trade school at one point, and I'm a mechanical draftsman. So... After I finished that was when I got my draft notice mm -hmm. because it wasn't considered a college. Okay. You were just mentioning that your, your brother was medically turned down. Uh, did friends join at the same time you did? 
No, mm -hmm. no, none of my friends. And you mentioned earlier the Great Lakes Naval Training Center, and that's where you were sent. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Tell us what basic training was like. Well, even before I got the basic training, what was the interesting thing was that the guys that I met in Boston, mm -hmm. when we got on the plane, it's like long hair, beards, personalities. It's like, you know, this one here, oh, he's a cool dude. You know, it's like, you know, the, uh, then the transition, we all get on the plane, we get to Great Lakes, and then, you know, we get there kind of late in the evening and stuff, and the next morning we get our haircuts. Oh boy. And they're all baldies. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I, I wouldn't would have been able to tell you who, who was who. <laughs> you know, we're all, we're all look generic, you know. Mm -hmm. It's like, we're all the same. So uh, Great Lakes was, you know, there was masses of, of, of uh, sailors that were, you know, in, at different levels that were, you know, marching. And, and, you know, you could tell the ones that had just gotten there and the ones that had been there for a little, you know, for a while longer. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was only on one side of the street. There was another side of the street which there were you could see the barracks and stuff. So it was, it was, it was a rude awakening, for a, a culture shock is more what it was. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, you're entering the military in a shall we say interesting period in American history. Yes, it was. I think uh, it was like that was. That was actually where Vietnam was uh, starting to wind down, but they mm -hmm. st still did have the draft. Um, I think the interesting part of it for, for me and kind of made me sad was the fact that, uh, you know, I was doing my duty and there were a lot of people that weren't doing their duty that were going to Canada, going to, uh, mm -hmm. you know, hiding in schools. A lot of my Friends, actually, I found out I'd gone into the seminary, so they wouldn't have to go, and then mm -hmm. came out of the seminary. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was, there was a lot of, and a lot of people didn't like the fact of that whole Vietnam period. So it was very difficult, you know, for for me. Mm -hmm. A lot of my friends couldn't understand why I would end up going into service. So it was a tough time. Yeah, but as far as basic is concerned. Uh, was there anything you really liked or disliked about it? Well, I think what basic, I think for me at that point, I was a young man and basically I really didn't have any direction. Mm -hmm. And what it did, it basically gave me a sense of direction. It, it, it did um, kind of like take the personalities issues uh, okay. for, for people and it was like everybody was the same. You work together, you... Um, it taught me to work together. It kind of gave me uh, uh, more to, to have to rely on myself mm -hmm. is what it did. So it, it, it did have its benefits. Mm -hmm. And what kind of advanced or specialized training did you receive? Well, the period that I was there for, for the actual period that you were there, you kind of learned the basics for mm -hmm. the first part of it, and that was where you learning to march, you, to, uh, the, uh, you know, how to address officers, how to uh, make your bed the correct way, your locker had to be set up a certain way, and everything folded a certain way, and you mm -hmm. wash it, and you, everything stenciled, so it was basically, it, it put you in a regimented thing of everybody following the same rules, to everyone the same way. Mm -hmm. That was basically the basic part and, and working as a team. You had your, your uh, company that you were with and there were tons of companies that were mm -hmm. there. Um, so what you did is you worked with your company and you had to work together. Uh, if you didn't, then the person that didn't work, they made it clear to them you know, as a team that they would have to work. So. Mm -hmm. Now, what, um, after basic, tell us what happened. Well, after basic, what happened was that when you were in the, in the basic, you had to take some tests. Mm -hmm. And the tests that you took basically were to give them an idea of where they should place you. So I put down all my five choices, anything related to drawing. Um, uh, 
a draftsman, you know, surveyor, um, some of those, you know, uh, but they didn't have any positions. I had to put down a fifth choice. My fifth choice was medic. Uh, why I put it down, I don't know. Uh -huh. And of course I get my fifth choice. <laughs> <laughs> so, and they go by your test as your skills and stuff. That's how uh -huh. they would also slot you in as to where you're going. So I ended up that I, after boot camp, which was about uh, 10 weeks, then I was assigned to, to, to core school, Corman school. Mm -hmm. um, so I got like a period of reprieve of a couple weeks, and then I had to return to core school, which actually was in, back in Great Lakes. So I went mm -hmm. home for two weeks, and then I came back to, to do the core school, which was 16 weeks. And that was with uh, medical training, learning about uh, bandage, how to bandage CPR, um, you know, how to do f uh, some of the um, some of the basic drugs. You know, kind of uh, showed you some things regarding suturing, um, types of things that you might need to do. It was a, it was a large blue book, mm -hmm. um, and that was a 16 weeks that you had to do that. So. In the back of your mind, were you thinking, as soon as I finish this training, they're shipping me off? Well, I knew that I, that was part of, we knew that we were going somewhere. Mm -hmm. after, that, after that particular training, we knew that we had to, part of the, tr the training was not only with the book part, but then the, the second part of it was that we all were assigned to hospitals. So what we were going to do is utilize some of this, this learning that we had and put it to use in a hospital. Mm -hmm. So I got my orders, which was for Chelsea Naval Hospital in Boston, which no longer exists. Mm -hmm. So, which was kind of nice for me. It was good because uh, I could actually live at home. And I was basically stationed there. I was assigned to a 25-bed ward, open ward, uh, which was a thoracic, um, uh, neuro, mm -hmm. urology, and plastic surgery floor. So it was like a mix of everything. There were all, basically all the people that were there were military people. A lot of them were Vietnam vets that had to have reconstructive surgery or some kind of surgery done. Some of them plastic surgery, some of it mm -hmm. urology, some of it uh, having bones, bone grafts and, and uh, you know, grafting and that. So um, I, I was a corpsman on the floor. Mm -hmm. um, we had a nurse who was, uh, managed the floor. Uh, usually it was a commander. Um, and I was there for approximately, I had to do, our shifts were for long shifts. We'd have to do like 12 hour shifts on the weekends. So we'd, we'd be on the floor from mm -hmm. night till early morning and stuff. And you mentioned you were a corpsman on the floor. Uh, what kind of duties did that pertain? The duty pertained to drawing blood, mm -hmm. starting IVs, suturing, dressing changes, handing out medications, giving shots. The same thing I was doing as a nurse that I'm doing when I went into nursing, the same things I was doing, doing elaborate dressing changes. I mean, we had a uh, chief of plastic surgery who had his residents working out of there, and he was from a Boston, big Boston hospital. So he had his, the residents there, he was training them, and they would be doing extensive uh, you know, uh, types of plastic surgery and grafts and uh, so we would have to do the treatments for them. We'd have to do the medications. We'd have to do, uh, you know, all of those types of things. Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, and then the, the, you know, basically the, the the nurses would just monitor the floor, and then because of controlled su substances like the shots, they would have to be accountable for those. So they would have a key to open it up so that we mm -hmm. could, you know, give the shot. And so. how long were you at Chelsea Naval? I was there for approximately, oh, maybe about a year, 
year and a half. Okay, so total. from the beginning of training, you're now around the end of 1971. Yeah. And tell us what happened then. Well, at that point, what happened was um, you're required to do uh, duty on a ship mm -hmm. or what they consider overseas duty. And overseas duty can be not being on a ship and going to field medical school. And field medical school is basically a school because the Marines do not have any medics. Mm -hmm. They use the Navy's corpsman. So I was assigned to Camp Pendleton, California mm -hmm. um, to field medical school to learn how to be outside and, and do, but not being on a ship somewhere, mm -hmm. so. Let's just show this, and this is, now which one is you in the? This is me right, this is me right here. Okay. And this is later, this mm -hmm. is like later after I had been there for probably about a year. Okay, and that is of course you in your uh, Marine Corps uniform. Right, right. And what rank were you at the time? That was uh, HM3. HM3. And below that, tell us what that was. Well, this was actually, um, during that period that I was there, I was in multiple kind of, uh, you know, types of things that we would have to do training for. This mm -hmm. here was where I was in the field for mm -hmm. um, approximately 10 days. It was, a, mm -hmm. it was an a, a escape evasion type of thing where mm -hmm. we were given food for three days and we were to survive for 10 days and and meet up with someone so it was uh mm. so you went through a whole series of trainings well actually yeah what happened was with the field medical school the field medical school was basically all the corpsmen would go to the field medical school mm -hmm. you know the ones that were assigned for the overseas they you know, we'd have to camp out, we'd have to, you know, kind of, uh, you know, watch out for the scorpions, which are out there, or rattlesnakes, which is another thing in, in that area. Um, and what we would do is we would kind of have to, you know, use the canteens and the, mm -hmm. that kind of, we'd be marching. We'd have the khaki uniforms. We would uh, uh, kind of learn how to do stuff out in the field. Mm -hmm. Once that was over with, that was approximately about 12 weeks. At that point, we were reassigned to the next part of our duty, and that was to, uh, the assignment was either to go to sit in one of the, you know, one of these buildings here, um, which I don't know where it is. Um, you know, kind of like a barracks, you know, like a white building or a white shed or something. And what would happen is they would have to, uh, you'd have to, the, if we were preparing for war, we got tons of boxes that are in there and you'd have to go through every single box with your list and check off to make sure that there's five pairs of gloves, check it off, five, 25 bandages, check it off. Mm -hmm. So. That was, that was what a lot of people would, would end up doing. And some would actually, they did have a hospital on the base and mm -hmm. the rest of those would go there. We're all sitting there in this big room and they're telling us where we're going and at. And then the uh, commander said, we have uh, a special spot here. It's volunteer. It's volunteer if you want to do this. This is not something that you have to do, but it's volunteer. Uh, special Forces would like uh, two medics, or they'd be happy with one corpsman. So the guy behind me, who I had, we had spoken to before, said, if you do it, I'll do it. If you do it, I'll do it. And it was like, I'm thinking to myself, I don't want to stencil boxes. I just can't, I don't think I can, that's so boring. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, if I'm gonna have to spend this whole time here, I wanna do something. So he and I volunteered. So what was interesting, we had seen this particular company when we were doing our field medical stuff. We were mm -hmm. on the base there going around. And I mean, when these guys went by us, it made our mouths 
drop. It was like, here we are in our scruffy khakis and stuff and our boots are mm -hmm. not shined and stuff. These guys are exercising. They're all like, look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, <laughs> you know, and uh, their boots are spit shined. They're wearing white t-shirts, they're wearing their hats, and they're like running. And I mean, they're running in unison and they're, they're doing their cadence and they're, you, you could tell that they were like in great shape and they mm -hmm. were, they were special. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, geez, you know, I like that, you know. So my friend and I both ended up joining. Mm -hmm. uh, it was called uh, First Force Reconnaissance Company and it's actually only during wartime. It's a company of about only 83. But we had to pass a physical in order to get in. So the physical was uh, getting up in the morning and starting physical therapy at 7 in the morning. And this was for a week, 7 in the morning. And basically, they would run you ragged. You'd be running through swamps, into the ocean, into the sand all day long. You get like a half an hour to, to have lunch, and then you'd report back out, and then they would continue again. You'd have to do sit-ups, you'd have to do pull-ups. They wanted to see what you could and couldn't do, and they also didn't want you if you didn't want to be there. And, that, and how they were going to do that was by breaking you to, to tell you that you're not good, you don't want, you don't want to be here, you know? So they were, they were doing a lot of that. So it ended up, I survived and so did my friend. Mm -hmm. Um, so we ended up being part of uh, First mm -hmm. Reconnaissance Special Forces. Okay, so now this brings us to what, around uh, early to mid-1972? This is about 72, yes. 72, yeah. okay. Yeah. Tell us what happened then. At that point, basically, I was uh, put in, I had all kinds of training programs that they were putting me into. Um, they had me do, uh, we went to San Clemente Island, which is off limits to the uh, civilians and that, and we uh, did, we were taught demolition. Um, we were taught, uh, you know, basically to live off the land. Um, some, uh, some, they, some people brought their snorkel gear, so they were snorkeling there, uh, and the other people, uh, uh, basically, the, the lessons we had were, were the demolition the whole time that we were there. Uh, that was one thing that we did. Um, another thing that we had done was uh, they did have uh, all the, of the, the people in the company were jump qualified, and they all had wore gold wings. Mm -hmm. They were trained um, at, uh, by our company. And what they did is they had, um, this was like the typical type of thing that they would do. Mm -hmm. They would drag an individual from behind a truck, mm -hmm. and it would be going pretty fast. And what they would be teaching the individual was how to release from the chute, mm -hmm. because this was a simulation of a parachute mm -hmm. dragging you with a strong wind mm -hmm. because sometimes that can happen and they wanted to make sure that the person would stay focused and do what they had to do and the other issue is too if you land in water it makes it even more difficult because what they would do is they would drag them part, part way into the water because when you when you got water coming in your mouth and mm -hmm. stuff you want you got to still mm -hmm. keep your head about you to, in order right. to to disengage mm -hmm. And I just wanted to have them show you the... Yeah. This was actually the, the company logo. Mm -hmm. It's a First Force Reconnaissance Company. It's, it's only mm -hmm. during wartime. Uh, and then it's disbanded when there's no war. Mm -hmm. um, there is a First Force Reconnaissance Battalion, but the company was, was more the, was the elite over the battalion. Um, this particular company here was jump qualified, scuba qualified, demolition, snow, snow, snow skiing, um, 
cold weather survival, mm -hmm. um, mountain climbing, rappelling. We actually, when I was there, we had war games. We played war games with the Green Berets, with the SEALs, all the ones that you see on TV. We, we, mm -hmm. we played with them. We, we had games where we would see who was the best and who could mm -hmm. outfox the other one. So it was, it was, uh, mm -hmm. it was, it was uh, an experience. Yeah. You were not only playing with the big boys, you were one of the big boys. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we would do, uh, th in fact, they used to even have, for the town of San Diego, they would have an event where th those big IBS rubber boats that they would have, there mm -hmm. was a, something where uh, the SEALs would have a team, we would have a team, um, and the, the, the lifeguards would have a team or something, and then what we would do is, um, go out through the waves, and usually the waves could be pretty high and stuff, and what it would be like a seven-man crew. You go out, get out beyond the waves. If you get any water in it, you're, you're required to broach the boat, which means turn it over, empty the water out, get the boat back up again, and then come back in and do it as fast as you can. So that was, that was kind of uh, an interesting thing that we used to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, another another kind of offside thing was that when I first went there, um, we picked up a stray dog, and he was probably, he, he looked kind of like a, uh, he was like a Sheltie type mm -hmm. of dog, but he was black and white. So the, the company adopted him. That dog did everything. <laughs> he jumped with us, he had, he got his own gold wings, he did about 10 jumps in the company. We called him Airborne Dog. Uh, he had, we jumped him in our kit bags. We had a big bag uh -huh. that uh, his head would be sticking out and would jump down. We would mountain rappel with him. We would, and I, uh, he would run with us and he could run us into the ground. I mean, <laughs> you know, but he was, he was, it was, it was, a, it, was a, it was kind of an experience mm -hmm. just to have a, you know, kind of like one of those, uh, you know, mascots for our company, so. Aside from, from being in fantastic physical shape, what were your duties with, uh, with the group? With the group, basically, I was um, required to uh, go out where they were jumping or scuba diving, um, where they're jumping. We did have incidents where people got hurt. Uh, we had someone that came out, out of a helicopter and had a May West. The May West is basically where the chute was like this, it didn't open, it was like oh coming my. down like this. And then he came down and just probably before he was 50 feet off the ground, he pulled his, his uh, reserve, which opened up and broke some of his fall. So he had some uh, vertebrae mm -hmm. that he had uh, fractured. Um, we had uh, someone that came out of a, uh, the other thing I was required to do was uh, rappelling and we used to put on shows for the Boy Scouts Jamboree, and one of the, uh, you know, we had a lot of, a lot of the guys in my company were hot doggers. You know, they all thought that they were like, you know, the best at everything. And one, you know, one thing about repelling is when you repel, you usually, when you're repelling, you you re come out, you repel, and you belay, mm -hmm. you stop yourself a little bit. But a lot of the guys, what they would would try to do is they would try to belay at the last second oh, so they dear. would just do one one belay instead of maybe two to get down so this one guy did a belay when he got and what happens is the ropes that they use have a stretch factor to them so he hit his coccyx so I mean he was hurt he was hurt and he was out for a little bit but he was mm -hmm. he went back in again um, we had someone that was scuba we had the uh, battalion uh, recon uh, do scuba, so we were out in the water um, in one of those landing barges we were doing scuba and, and it was a buddy system and you know they always taught you that the buddy system and what happened was that uh, one of them pushed his buddy away his mask came off um, so then everyone was called out of the water and then what what they basically did was look for air bubbles because of his regulator still pushing bubbles off mm -hmm. from it so, and one, then once they found that, then two divers immediately went in uh, to find him. They brought him up. He was unresponsive. So we had to do CPR on him. He swallowed a lot of water. 
we had to take the the uh, since we were out in the water, we had to head back in, uh, doing CPR, and then a helicopter picked him up, and he he survived. Oh, good. So, but uh, yeah, I, I did a lot of uh, kind of neat schools. It was not only the uh, I did repelling. Mm -hmm. Uh, we did something called an Australian repel. We did like four or five different repels, left-handed, right-handed, because what would happen is we would um, have to um, take someone down mm -hmm. out of the mountain with, uh, I don't know whether I have it here. Yep. I'm back side here. Yeah, right here. Whereas they take them back down on a stretcher so that means if, if someone's up in the mountain, you have to get them back down. You have mm -hmm. to know how to repel in order to get them down. Um, so, but the other thing that was kind of a very strange thing to do was called an Australian repel. And that was something the Australians came up with. And that was where the problem with repelling, especially if you have an enemy or something, is you're repelling mm -hmm. backwards. And they're firing on you, so you don't have a chance to fire at them. An Australian repel is where you, you're face forward coming down. So you're basically, you, you come down like this with your right. face looking towards the ground. And what you can do is you can hold your weapon in front of you to, to fire where you need to fire. So we, we, we did Australian repel and, and repelling. We did, mm -hmm. uh, jumped out of helicopters. We did, uh, we did rec night reconnaissance. They dropped us off. Uh, in the middle of the night in February in Coronado Harbor. Uh, they dropped us off a PT boat doing about 35 knots. We were in wetsuits, and, and I had a, uh, a paddle with a small light tape to it, mm -hmm. and other people had different equipment that they were to have, and what we did is we swam into the beach in the dark. Uh, one person, two or three people went in, and then they brought in a gradient reel, which had ribbons that were like uh, you could feel with your hand. The gradient, and then what would happen is someone would start off from the shore on a signal from these lights that you could only see if you were like right in front of it. And that was to get everyone that was still out on the water to hold, hold off. Basically, everyone would kind of come in, and then as, when they felt their knot, then they would go with their knot out into the water. And, and these gradient reels were about 250 yards. And then what would happen is they would get a signal, like a tug. One tug would mean every other man dives down into the water as far as he can go. We had slate, uh, slate things attached around our neck. And what we could do is we could write on them there. They would be fluorescent so that we could see what we were putting on them. And what we would basically do is try to grab some kind of earth, and then we would also tell the depth that we went down. So then after that was all done, then they would have this, the second group do it. And then what we'd do is we would move down the beach maybe for about 50 to 100 yards. What this would do is, this is beach reconnaissance, you could put together you know, with the wave, um, you know, the types of waves that are there, you know, how many there are. So basically you could have a landing party come in. You would know what was below the surface of the water, you know, that it doesn't have steel mm -hmm. structures, you know, like a Dunkirk. They had all the, mm -hmm. the stuff in the water right. that, you know, um, you know. So this was like in preparation to, to, for a landing. Mm -hmm. So we did that. Uh, we did... Uh, uh, they had the scuba, they had the, a lot of repelling, we did a lot of repelling. We also did another thing called spying. Spying was something that I really didn't want to do. The whole thing about this is I have a fear of heights. Uh -huh. And I was hoping that by doing a lot of this stuff I would get rid of my fear of heights. I still had a fear of heights, but I would do it. But anyhow, spying is what they would use in, in Vietnam. And it was, it was where they would bring a helicopter over a site where there are men, maybe they, in a, there could be like palm trees or something, and you can't really see them, but what you do is you drop a cable through the trees, and then the men would all have light, lightweight vests with a little hook on them. And probably the cable could hold up to maybe about uh, eight 
guys, and what we would do is we would hook onto the, it was, basically it was just a big Velcro mm -hmm. cable. Um, we'd hook onto the side of it, one side, and the other guy would hook on his side, put my arm around his shoulder like this, put my arm out to the side like this, and then the helicopter would go straight up, lifting all of us straight through the trees. And what would happen is, at the top of the thing, they had like a, an umbrella type thing that would open the trees up so that we would be able to get out. Now, when they, they didn't practice that on us, but what, we, what they did practice on us was hooking up and going up. And I mean, we were very, very high. You know, it's like, it was like, what I liken it to is being on an airplane and looking when you see all the little square postage things and we're dangling outside with just a strap holding us. And you know, I'm holding on to the guy here. We're trying to we stabilize the thing by putting our arms out, and he's got his arm out, and we wrap our legs at the center of the and basically they that's how they would save us. Mm -hmm. So that was another thing that we did. And how long were you doing this? <laughs> Oh, they, oh th that particular thing, we only would, you know, we would practice it and stuff. Mm -hmm. We would, we would uh, uh, be doing different mm -hmm. types of things. We, we, they sent us to uh, cold weather survival, mm -hmm. where we had to be, um, the, the temperatures were minus, mm -hmm. minus, and, and it was like, it was uh, where basically you would, dig in the snow. We had snowshoes and we had to dig in the snow. We had a 40 pound backpack we had to hike in. And then we would uh, make a bed and then cover the whole thing over with our ponchos and with snow mm -hmm. and try to make it warm. One candle, I have to tell you, can be pretty warm. Mm. I mean, it was freezing. It was freezing cold. You know, we, we camped out at the Continental Divide. We did cross country, learned how to cross. The Green Braves taught us how to cross country, downhill ski. Um, we went to, uh, we had an experience where that one picture that you had seen regarding mm -hmm. the escape and the evasion, they basically dropped us off with three days of food. And then uh, they told us that they were going to pick us up at a certain point, and then they told us. We're not going to get you. You're going to stay out there for another, you know, seven days. So we have most of the people, some people had already eaten their food, and some people were smart enough to, to hang on to it knowing, you know, they'll, they'll play some kind of game with us. And we were in, we were in a forest area uh, in California. And what we were supposed to do is they, they gave us a mission. We were supposed to do reconnaissance. That's what we were supposed to do. So we couldn't move around during the day. We had to do all our moving at night. Um, and it was kind of interesting because with a lot of that area there, it was that, that time period when there was a lot of marijuana, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of that, um, and also there were a lot of people that were coming over Mexico mm -hmm. and stuff and uh, sneaking across the border. And uh, we were walking along this one area and there was this house and it was, it was, this little puppy was sitting on the, on the stairs, and we're like, one person went to look and said, it's only one little puppy. We should be able to, and he's sleeping. We should probably be able to get by with, with no problems. So we decided we'd take a chance and, and move by the house. Well, he just made like, woof. And the whole porch ignited with about eight dogs that had been sleeping there. They were probably watchdogs for, Mm -hmm. In case the, you know, the marijuana people were mm -hmm. coming, or I mean, the, so it was like we just we we ran off and stuff. But it was like, uh, and then we had an incident where uh, we were uh, in jeeps and we were on the dirt roads and we had a car that wasn't supposed to be there that pulled up in front of us, and we. Uh, got out and we asked them what they were doing there because we had permission to be on this particular area. And the driver got out and uh, we found out that they didn't have any, they were basically sneaking across on the border. So we mm -hmm. took their car and we, we, we had to alert the authorities to have them come and pick up. And while we're, while they're telling us about what's going on, you know, these, these guys, were, you know, we're sharing our food and everything with them. 
we hear all this noise. We opened up the trunk. This is a big car. Five people in the trunk. Five more people were hiding inside the trunk of the car. So it was like when the guy came, he had to take seven, seven people that, that tried to sneak across the border. But that was one of the issues that they had. I mean, we were, um, you know, while we were out there, you know, we weren't, you know, we weren't supposed to be seen. Um, we did have another incident. Which, what happened was on that where we were out there uh, was uh, after about the seventh or eighth day, the water that we had been drinking was just so bad, and we were we were all pretty hungry, mm -hmm. and we we were told that our uh, the place that they wanted to meet us, there was going to be the IBS rubber boats were going to be waiting for us at this certain location, and we were supposed to get to them, and then once we got to them, there would be a signal offshore, and we'd have to get in our boats and 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 meet them offshore. And at this point, you know, everyone's like exhausted, they're tired. This was that picture that you had seen of me earlier. <laughs> if, you, if I turned around, you would see that I didn't have any back of my pants from, from sliding on the rocks and stuff because oh, of all the, uh, you know, it's like there was no pants mm -hmm. left. The, the material had completely been worn away from rock climbing and everything else. Um, but so anyhow, we were told to, to meet at this area and in order we had to get across a highway. So we decided, well, we've got to get some water. So my, the captain that was with me said, well, we're going to send three of you to fill up our canteens. There's a rest area right there. And uh, go in there and fill up your canteens. And so we, we ended up going in there. And, and, and I'll never forget it because people pull over from the highway, you know, because of, <laughs> you know, to go to the bathroom and all that other stuff. This little kid in there just turned around and looked at us, and he goes, "You know, we're like, you know, we're, but all the, the makeup on us, and we're all like, you know, probably smell high to heaven, <laughs> you know." And it's like he goes, "Are you guys duck hunters?" <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, "Oh, we wish we were, you know." <laughs> but uh, we got our water, we left, and then we we ended up going to the uh, the meetup for the. Uh, the IBS boats, and we had to go out in the middle of the night when it was hard uh, because we we uh, had to carry we had our weapons with us, mm -hmm. um, so we had to everything had to be tied down so we wouldn't lose anything. But the boats, mm -hmm. once they fill up with water, it's, it's like it's like you know trying to you know paddle. You just had to paddle as hard as you could because the waves just kept on hitting us. Mm -hmm. We finally got out and we were exhausted and stuff. It was. Uh, you know, it was a whole experience. It was a lot of training. Actually, we had, um, there was one point when I was there where we were actually put on alert uh, for not going to Vietnam, because that had wound down, but to um, be the, uh, go in as reconnaissance for Israel. When Israel was having a uh, problem, um, Issues on the Golan Heights mm -hmm. and that they were going to they were going to use us yeah. to go in. And when was this? Around seventy three. This was about seventy three or so. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so how long were you with the company overall? Well, after I left Chelsea Naval Hospital, I was with them until the end. And when was so that? Was the probably end? about a couple of years. A couple of years. Yeah. Okay. And um. So when uh, when did you get out? I got out in seventy uh, four. And what was your rank? I was an HM three. And you and you stayed with the the first comp that first company until first first force recon right yeah yeah the whole time. Mm. And you were basically helping train. Uh, at least you were. Um, I mean, a lot of the people that you were training with would be sent overseas. Yeah. yeah. Uh, basically, I, even though I was a medic, mm -hmm. you know, as a corpsman, I, my weapon was a forty-five. Mm -hmm. I kept my forty-five, and I also carried an M sixteen, because to me it was like you know, forty-five is not going to do anything if I 
need mm -hmm. something, I need an M16. You know, and I did some training on an M60 machine gun just so that I would know mm -hmm. about it. Um, and then what I would do is learn by learning some of these other things, like by learning the repelling mm. and that kind of stuff. When we would go somewhere, we would be the teachers. So I would be teaching other Marines how to repel. So, you know, I would, uh, you know, pass the information off that I, they would use me as a teacher and I would basically mm -hmm. be there in case anyone got hurt too. Okay. So I was kind of there in a double role. I think that they wanted, and what was kind of, what, what was kind of ironic too, which I thought was, uh, I'm, I'm the medic. I'm the one that's going to fix these guys up because I have the better eyesight and the better listening. They put me on point. So I'm, mm -hmm. when we're out in patrols, I'm the guy out in front because I pick stuff up, you know, and, and so it was kind of like that they were, <laughs> you know, it, but I mean, I didn't care. It was like, you know, it was fine with me. Okay. So. And where did you um, get out of the military? I got out of the military at Camp Pendleton. Mm -hmm. California, and uh, drove home from there. All the way across country? Yeah, yeah. That must have been an experience. Yeah, it was an experience, yeah. I had a lot of people that wanted uh, me to stop by and stuff mm -hmm. uh, that had gotten out earlier before me. Um, I, I did stop at a couple of them. Um, I don't, I, I've kept up with maybe uh, Two or three, one one corpsman that actually uh, got on the plane with me. I saw him maybe about ten years ago, and he he uh, he's a professional gambler. You know, that's what his occupation is, and it's like. Um, and then the other one uh, was in Ohio. I stopped, and he he was actually the one that went mm -hmm. into uh, first force recon with me, and. Uh, you know, so he was, you know, we kind of always kept in touch a little bit. Mm -hmm. So he... After the service, did you join any organizations? No. You know, my father, my father was in the legions mm -hmm. when he post-war. Mm -hmm. um, I thought about it, you know, just to join the same thing that my father did, but I never have. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know why, you know, I kind of hem and haw about it sometimes, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I mean, overall, if um, if you like walked into a post, just on a visit, did they, uh, did the fellow service members welcome you, or? Uh, I've never did walked they... into a post. Mm -hmm. No. I never, I never mm -hmm. have been in one. Oh, you mean like? Uh... Say that you're visiting a VFW. Uh, did the older veterans would they treat you any different, or no. any Vietnam veteran? No. 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 You never saw that. Okay. No. No, I don't, I, you know, I mean, I have no, um, you know, I've ta talked to some, uh, I had some friends that are veterans and stuff, mm -hmm. you know, that are, um, you know, and, but they, some of them were actually right in the skirmishes and stuff, mm -hmm. and, you know, they're, they're telling me about it, you know, uh, stuff that was going on. Mm -hmm. I think I was more... You know, in case of the war, they were still stockpiling with the services and trying to mm -hmm. get people ready because I'm sure that they weren't sure, you know, the whole Vietnam thing. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, they were trying to get it to wind down, but it, you know, I don't know, you know, whether they were really sure, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, they continued with the draft mm -hmm. at that point. So, I mean, my, my life probably would have been a lot different, you know, than what I've done now. I mean, it, it did help me in a sense that uh, when I got out, I went to nursing school. Mm -hmm. I used the GI Bill. I went to Newton Wellesley School of Nursing, which is no longer there. Uh, it was a two two year school diploma, and it had a lot of uh, bedside experience. And it was more the learning experience that I needed to do because of the I had a lot of the bedside, you know, taking care of people. And then I found what I found by doing that was I found I was actually limited in what I was, what I had been able to do mm -hmm. and what I was going to be able to do as a nurse. It was like they, it was like everyone had their individualized roles as to what mm -hmm. they did. So I went to the nursing school. I ended up getting my bachelor's later on um, in, a, in um, 
uh, my BA, uh, not my BSN. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've kept up over the years. I did critical care nursing, which was what I liked mm -hmm. to do. Uh, worked at Leonard Morse Hospital for 30 years. A critical care nurse and recovery room nurse. Um, and then I got into like discharge planning and then um, setting up services for people and then I worked for the Natick Visiting Nurses Home Care. That's kind of where I've, I've done up to this point. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. uh, overall, uh, how do you regard your military experience? Well, you know, I think that initially I I didn't like it, and the reason I didn't like it was because there was such, the whole population was against it. Mm -hmm. I felt, you know, it's like uh, there was just this thing regarding, you know, uh, if I have a day off and I go to the beach, as soon as, as soon as the military base, you know, people start getting off, the whole beach empties out. You know, people... I mean, I, I had a girlfriend at that point. She didn't want anything to do with me. Mm -hmm. She wanted to know why I didn't go to Canada. Mm -hmm. You know, and it was like, but that was the mindset of the people. Mm -hmm. I would have to say it was probably good for me. Mm -hmm. it, it gave me direction because I didn't have that direction at that mm -hmm. point. I was like floundering around. It gave, and it gave me the job skill that pushed me into health, health care. Mm -hmm. you, know, and I, you know, I like helping people. So I found I found that, and I found that I found that my experience was was an experience that you know a lot of adventurers would would have to pay top dollar for, and I got it for nothing. Mm -hmm. You know. Just curious, did you ever um, do you still dabble in art, or is healthcare pretty much your your bag right now? No, I I, I do art once in a while. Mm -hmm. I don't uh, I do it I do it infrequently. Mm -hmm. um, and probably that I don't do it more is I don't have the time, mm. you know. So, um, but I I think the other thing that that happened for me too was that I've had to relearn learn to rely on myself mm -hmm. a lot in everything that I do. You know, I'm a kind of a person that that will read a book or watch a DVD and then do it, mm -hmm. kind of. And that before I I wasn't like that, uh, and I've always. To this day, they ingrained exercise in me. I still, mm -hmm. I still, as long as I'm healthy, I still exercise. Mm -hmm. I've always done that my my whole life because when I was there, it was like every single day it was physical therapy every single day, and it was like, and you could see the results, and you could see the, you felt better. Mm -hmm. It helped you physically and mentally, kept you sharp. So mm -hmm. that was a, a plus out of it, too. Mm -hmm. When you were describing some of the exercises that you were going through with recon, I just keep, I keep thinking about what they have these days in Special Forces with all the electronics and computers and stuff like that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, no, they just had free weights, and they had a lot of the stuff that they had, they had to do on them by themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, I mean, on a weekend, it would be like, you know, I'll go for a five-mile run, you know, and I go, I mean, the nice thing about it was that they were on the ocean. So it was that you could run through the terrain part first mm -hmm. and then head into the ocean, and, walk, and running on sand is, is, is difficult to do. Mm -hmm. You know, th it was kind of interesting. I think when I first took my, they have like a um, test that they give you just to see where you're at, you know, physically and stuff. And I remember the three things were sit-ups, uh, pull-ups, uh, sit-ups, pull-ups, and a run, mm -hmm. okay? When I first went there, I could do my run for three miles, 28 minutes, mm -hmm. okay? I could do sit-ups, I could probably do about 50 in two minutes. And then for pull-ups, I could probably do two. <laughs> when I left, mm -hmm. okay, when I left, I could do 32 pull-ups. I could do 110 sit-ups in two minutes. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And I could run three miles in 16 minutes. Wow. You know, so it was like, I mean, it was, and it was like, I mean, there were some, some people there that, you know, I, I wasn't even close to being the best. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them were just like unbelievable, mm. you know? So, I mean, that was, that was a, you know, that got me in shape, got me, um, got my mind on straight. You know, it was a good experience. Would I would I say it's good for everybody? Uh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it depends what area you go into. I mean, I think that there are, the service does have good areas to, if you can get into an area to do some training because jobs sometimes seem so bad or hard. I mean, I had a friend that went into uh, the Air Force, and he came out. He did stuff with computers. He came out and he, he worked works for EMC. You know, his, his experience, I mean, he did like um, kind of maintenance and stuff on them and fixing them. Mm -hmm. But even that part, they, they, they need them fixed, you mm -hmm. know, so he, that's what he did. Mm -hmm. so. Well, David, is there anything else you'd like to say before we wrapped up this interview? Uh, no, mm -hmm. not really. I just thank you very much for the mm -hmm. opportunity to do this. Mm -hmm. Well, David Hawley, we thank you for coming in and interviewing with the Natick Veterans Oral History Project. Thank you.